Um, thanks for everyone who's joining now. Um, and yeah, so this will be a two hour deep dive interview. If you have to hop off, that's fine. But Justin, who's our certified EOS implementer and is basically the franchise uh, implementer, or I guess implementer to the stars and franchising. So he works with a lot of franchises from franchisees on up. Um, and he'll, he'll be able to give you, you know, a good, uh, good overview of what you're looking for. Um, Sydney, are we recording this? I can't remember. Yes, ma'am. Perfect. So then we will be able to send out the recording afterwards as well. If you want to share it with your teams. Um, all right. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Justin. We are both on here. Um, so if you have questions, you want to type it into the chat, feel free. Um, and you, like I said, you can hop on and off as you wish. All right, Justin, go ahead. And we had a hundred people register for this, for the recording or live. So there is something to be said for EOS. And my quick little pitch is one, there is no referral thing here. We are literally just hosting this because of what it does for the franchise space. I use it in NetSertive. We use it in my personal franchises. I've used it as a franchisor and it, it truly is incredible. And that's coming from someone who hates meetings, hates paperwork and hates due diligence. And I would never operate without it now. So awesome. Go ahead, Justin. <laughs> thanks for the, thanks for the warm intro, Madeline. Thanks everybody. I know two hours is a huge commitment. So I promise it's going to be Worth your time. You're gonna get some. You're gonna get nuggets today. You'll hopefully you'll have several aha moments, and you'll be able to take some of these actionable tips, recommendations into your business this afternoon if you choose. By the way, Sydney, if there's any way to have people to to show their video feed, it just help helps me give a better uh, talk when I feel like I'm when I'm talking to people and seeing their their faces. So if there's any way to enable that, that would be awesome. So let's get started. My name is Justin Mink. I am a CFE and certified EOS implementer. I'm also happy to say I'm a franchisee. So EOS is a franchise. Um, I, my background, and I'll tell you more a little bit about me, kind of splits the difference between entrepreneurship and startup worlds and working as a supplier with a lot of franchises. So for me, the opportunity to both be an entrepreneur, start my own business as an EOS implementer and be a franchisee was was the easiest decision I ever made. It was like my my world's colliding in the most beautiful way possible. So let's let's just get right into it. So our agenda is super simple. There's a couple of housekeeping rules I want to uh, items I want to go through here in a moment, but the agenda is simple. We're gonna get real. Right? This is not theory. This is not fad. EOS is all about practical application. I also want you to be real with yourself. And about new ideas, new perspectives, new ways of looking at your business, be real with me. I want to make sure that I get your questions. If something doesn't make sense, doesn't resonate, you want more clarity, fire off. We're going to take plenty of pauses. Uh, Sydney's going to be filled in the chat. So put your questions or thoughts in the chat. Also, just unmute your mic if you have a question. And guys, if you can allow that at, for, at certain breaks, would love this to be interactive. So we're going to keep it real. We're going to keep it super simple. To me, that was the most compelling thing about EOS when I first read the book Traction is how sim simple it was. I have yet to meet a leader or an entrepreneur who said, you know what, I just need more complexity in my life. Things are not complicated enough. So one of my favorite quotes in the world from the master Leonardo da Vinci, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication, right? It certainly is not easy, but it's worth, it's a worthwhile endeavor and EOS boils it down to the fundamentals and keeps things crazy simple. And we're going to talk about things that are proven to get results. Again, not theory, not philosophy. EOS takes a lot of timeless concepts and business thought leaders and, and converts those concepts into practical tools to deploy in the business to help you run a better business and frankly, live a better life. So that's the big picture agenda. Some housekeeping, and then we'll get into a more tactical agenda. If you can help it, look, we're not live in person. There's a little more, it's easier to have a little more dynamic energy with one another when we're sitting in a room. But the fact that we're on Zoom, just if you can help it, try not to be distracted by other windows and buzzes and beeps. EOS is a system. All these parts and pieces harmonize to orchestrate all the moving parts in your business, right? It's like the human body. You can't have a warm beating heart without a working set of lungs. You can't have a working set of lungs without a warm beating heart. So if you miss something, you might, be confused at all the other elements because all these components ultimately tie together and kind of synchronize. 
uh, again, if it's possible to to show people's cameras, I just like to see faces. It helps me feel like I'm I'm talking to an audience and not myself. But if it's not possible, that's okay. Let's make this interactive, right? Two hours is a long time for me to talk at you. So I will take plenty of pauses to field questions in the chat, or if you guys can allow people to to flip their mics on at certain parts of the the the, the presentation to fire away with questions or things you're not certain about or confused about or want more detail about. We'll also have plenty of time for Q&A at the end, but let's let's make this conversational if we can. And I just want open and honest. Be open and honest with yourself. Be vulnerable with yourself. New ideas, new perspectives. Detach your ego from ideas, right? Turn, turn up the curiosity, turn down the judge, because some of this is unwinding old patterns and behaviors and a lot of things that especially those of us from corporate America kind of the bad, bad habits that we grew up in our professional lives with. So be ready to look at things in a whole new way, a whole new light. And definitely if something doesn't make sense, be honest with me. Trust me, I've heard them all the questions before. And uh, I want you guys to get the most out of this. The way you're going to do that is just by opening your mind to new ideas. So some a more tactical agenda. Quick intro to EOS for those who are unfamiliar, who just don't know it that well, give you the story about EOS. I'll tell you a little bit about my background and what, what brings me here with you today, why I'm an EOS implementer. We're going to spend most of our time on the EOS foundational tools. So the 80-20, the, the right? 20% of the EOS tools that will give you 80% of the value, the real foundational stuff that you really can start using this afternoon or tomorrow. We're going to spend the back, back part, the last... 20, 30 minutes going through some EOS for franchise use cases. So as everyone on this call knows, franchising is a unique animal, lots of different stakeholders. And so there's unique ways EOS can be applied in just about every use case for franchises. So we're going to go through uh, some of the primary ones. And then we're going to talk about some resources, some free resources for you guys to use after this. This is just a two hour workshop. So I'm gonna give you some takeaways, things things you can go use, pull, download, watch uh, to keep dripping this at you, especially if you're compelled enough to start thinking about using EOS in your business. Hopefully we'll have some time for some Q&A at the end and then we'll wrap it up. All right, rock and roll. Let's get real. So you, if you are, look, I remember I, was a leader. Before I was an EOS implementer, I spent my career leading teams in startup environments uh, as a C-level, VP-level on teams, managing and leading people. And uh, there's a saying by a philosopher mathematician who was a contemporary of Albert Einstein. He said, you cannot be a part of a system while at the same time understanding that system. So you are in it. You are up to your eyeballs. I remember when I was starting a company coming home from work one day, like a 12 hour day. And we had a, uh, a toddler at the time. And you know, those little uh, toys where you roll them and the balls pop around. And I grabbed my kid's toy and started rolling it and said to my wife, this is what my brain feels like right now. It's just a, a, a mass of synapses and neurons firing. And it's total chaos, like pinball ball, balls in my head. So I'm going to ask you my passionate plea for you, the mindset I want you to adapt for the remaining of our time together is just step outside of that stuff. This is like a wusa moment, serenity now, right? You have carved out two hours of your valuable time to step away from all the stuff, the tyranny of the urgent, the chaos, the fire drills, all that's gonna be there waiting for you when you get back. I promise the world will keep revolving on its axis. The way you're gonna get the most out of this is if you kind of step outside and above Close your eyes and just kind of that serenity now moment. This is really a couple hours where we're going to be talking about how do we work on your business versus in it. Because your job as leaders, frankly, is to create that space. And you're doing that. So I applaud you for your commitment. Please adopt that mindset. That's how we're going to get the most out of, out of, the, out of this session we have together. All right. Rock and roll. Hey, Justin. It's yeah. Maddie. We're going to, um, I think, promote everyone to a panelist so that they can turn cameras and mics on so guys just stick with us because we're doing it on the fly but i we're gonna attempt to do that <laughs> okay appreciate that guys okay. if it doesn't work it doesn't work it's it, okay. it will still this will it'll be fine but <laughs> it'll be great to get look at it people especially when you have questions to be able to look at your eye to eye so 
All right, EOS, for those of you who are familiar, and those of you who are not, there's a book called Traction, Get a Grip, by, written by a lifelong entrepreneur named Gino Wickman. It was published about 15 years ago. Last year, it, it celebrated over a million copies sold. That's the book that introduced EOS to the world. Gino Wickman is the author. Lifelong entrepreneur who got brought in by his dad to run his family's real estate marketing company when he was a young guy in his 20s. Saw it was in need of a turnaround and successfully turned the business around. After seven years of running and growing the business, sold the business and spent the next 18 months transitioning to a new leadership team. And over that time frame, he became one of the founding members of the entrepreneurial organization, the EO chapter in Detroit. And that's when he started working with business owners and entrepreneurs in and around Michigan, which is where EOS is still headquartered. And he realized that there was this kind of void in the marketplace. As he was working with all these entrepreneurs, he, he saw that there was no real center of excellence. And they were all kind of reinventing the wheel. And, and most of them were living in a state of chaos, right? Kind of fighting, fighting battles with two swords, putting Band-Aids on gaping wounds, playing business whack-a-mole. And the predominant sort of feeling that most entrepreneurs have in his experience is that feeling where you work 12 hours, your head hits the pillow at night. You know it was a crazy day and you don't know what you got accomplished. You have no idea what you got done. So what he wanted to do was create a set of simple tools for not, not built for bureaucracies and big global corporations that move super slow and have a lot of bureaucracy and red tape, but something for businesses that move fast, where there's a, a real uh, a pace of change that is impossible for bureaucracies to keep up with. And he wanted to create a, a set of tools that can be used to unleash the entrepreneurial spirit. There you are, Diane. Good to see you. Yay. You look great. You look great. Nice and tan, too. <laughs> tools. Yeah, we're voting, everyone. So if you want, you can accept and then turn your video and or camera on. Okay, thanks. Sorry, thanks, Justin. Guys. <laughs> That's all right. So a set of tools to really unleash the entrepreneurial spirit, the agility, the, innovative, the innovation of entrepreneurs, a framework that they can operate with and to channel those energies to create a vision and create the discipline and execution that, that those visionaries need to achieve their vision. So it's really what EOS is. You have to boil it down to its absolute essence. It's just the complete simple set of practical tools that, that treat the common problems, challenges, and frustrations facing entrepreneurs and their leadership teams. And it was really based on two primary discoveries that Gino had. The first is that the average company is full of people who are working their tails off, super committed, but are living in that safe sense of chaos, right? Most entrepreneurs, when they get into owning a business, the entrepreneurial life attracts them because they want to they want to have agency over their lives. They want to be the ones in control. They want to architect the life that they want to live. And what ends up happening is, in Gino's experience, 19 times out of 20 or fully 95% of the business he was working with, the leaders felt the other way. They felt like the business was in control of them, right? So that's that sense of frustration, that sense of never having control. One out of 20 of the businesses he was working with had that sense of control, had a sense of balance, was equally as committed as the other 19, but was achieving, making progress every day, every week, every quarter towards the achievement of their vision with that sense of real balance. And so that discovery really drove the obsession that Gino eventually had with creating this set of tools this obsession about what the what the difference between the companies run by those frustrated entrepreneurs and the and the five percent of the entrepreneurs who are running the world's truly great businesses. The other discovery that he had is that every entrepreneurial business, every business, wrestles with about 130 issues at any given time, and those issues really are are symptoms, right? They manifest as pain in the business, and to the those one out of twenty. The way they move, the way they breathe in the business, they were just able to get down underneath those painful symptoms to the root causes and solve problems as they arose for good. And so these two discoveries were really the foundation of what drove the creation of EOS. Now, Gino was the first implementer ever. Today, we're a franchise. There are over 750 of us around the world, mostly in North America. The last numbers that I heard is that collectively over the last 15 years, we've run something like 156,000 full day sessions 
with 23,000 clients. And that's just those who have hired people like me, not including the untold, you know, hundreds of thousands that have read the book Traction and have run EOS tools to one degree or another in their business. So this is, when I say this is battle, you know, battle tested, road, road driven, iron sharpens iron stuff. This model has evolved and grown over the year based on what, over the years, based on what clients have told us has worked. This is real stuff that has been proven to drive results in businesses. I'll tell you a little bit about my story, what, what brought me here. A lot of the people on the call are probably familiar with me from my five years at Scorpion, digital marketing agency, leading our, our franchise team there. But really, my career has split the difference between entrepreneurship and, fran and franchise suppliers. So my entrepreneurial career started in my 20s. I had this corporate desk job, nine to five, Fortune 50 company. And I started this side hustle that ended up being way more fun and generating me more income two days a week than my nine to five. So that gave me the, the, the itch, the entrepreneurial itch. And as every leader and entrepreneur knows, there's a lot of highs and lows on that journey. As exhilarating as the highs can be, it's the lows where you learn the most valuable lessons that you can take forward. So for me, my high and my biggest high and low happened almost simultaneously. My, uh, I started a company in North Texas and Dallas about 11 years ago, sat down in a park with a former colleague and said, let's do something. And we picked the idea that compelled us most and was the craziest business idea around music, marketing, brand sponsorships, <clears throat> and technology. And said, let's do it. We started a company. It's called Music Audience Exchange. Today, it's got well over 100 employees, has done north of $100 million in revenue over the life of the company. We raised multiple millions of dollars. That was a great high. Followed pretty shortly thereafter by a pretty terrible low. I was only at that company full time for a few years because I ended up getting really sick. Um, I got uh, full transparency. I got Epstein Barr virus mono, which is a, a, a probably a lot of you with kids. Your kids have gone through it. My assistant's kid has it right now. Um, usually, you're sick for a few weeks. You get over it. Well, when you're a 37 year old man working 80 hours a week, it's probably why I got sick in the first place. Not so easy to get over, especially when you're not letting your mind and your body and your spirit rest, and you're trying to ignore it and keep going as hard as you've ever been because you don't know any other way. I just got sicker. I was also engaged to be married at the time. I just kept getting sicker and sicker and sicker until finally I, I really had no choice but to take a step back. You know, at that time, I thought I was done with leadership and entrepreneurship. Uh, I thought it was synonymous with chaos, with stress, with sacrificing your health, your relationships, your time for any other passions and interests in life. So I was done. I went back into sort of home for me. That's when I joined Scorpion, working with franchises as a supplier. Certainly not easy, but simple, uh, much simpler and straightforward, nine to five, you know, good compensation, benefits, all that stuff. I thought I was done. A few years later, a franchise client of mine, a good friend, I'll just give him a shout out, Goldfish Swim Schools, Shanna Christen, who to this day still works with Gino Wickman as their implementer. And I knew they were a great company, great culture, uh, growing. She handed me a copy of Traction, said, read it. And I did. And I had two emotions within 20 pages. The first was, I was frankly kind of ticked off. There were answers to questions that I didn't think had answers. And I thought, if where has this been my career? If, if I had discovered this sooner, maybe it would have made a difference in the trajectory of my career. Like, entrepreneurship and leadership doesn't have to be so stressful and chaotic. And, and there are simple tools you can use to help you run a better business and, and feel more in a sense of control, more balance. But the other emotion I had was, was inspiration. I was inspired to get back into an entrepreneurial venture. So I joined a small startup digital agency after leaving Scorpion under the condition that we run EOS. And we did, and it was transformative. It took us about six months to fully kind of stitch EOS into the fabric of how we ran the business to really internalize it and master it. Over that six month time frame, our revenue velocity doubled and we made work-life balance a company value and actually capped every employee in the company's uh, max hours a week at 40 including the founder who was previously on that 70 hour grind with eight kids, mind you, kind of working in the garage night and day while his wife and nanny raised, raised the kids on their own. So for me, that, that was just a transformative experience. I 
uh, found out that EOS was a franchise. And to me, again, that was the universe just kind of telling me what I needed to do. For me, this is a real personal and professional calling. And my, I feel like the reason I'm here is to help other entrepreneurs and leaders experience the same kind of upgrades to the quality of their business and, and their life, frankly, that, that EOS made possible for me, hopefully sparing people kind of the pain and suffering that I had to go through on the journey to get to this place of balance. So that's what I'm here. That's why I'm here. That's what makes me excited to be in a, with a group like you guys, because I've seen it, I felt it, and I know it can do the same for you and really any business that, that commits to, to running on EOS. That's my story. So another set of kind of sub discoveries that Gino had was some common frustrations that entrepreneurs share. If you feel or have ever felt any of these things, not only are you not alone, you're in good company because this, this stuff is normal. So again, that feeling of that sense of control or lack of it, right? This feeling that you just, I have a client who described it as feeling like the business is a bus careening down a, a bumpy potholed highway and they're running to scramble to catch up and climb in, get control. And every time they got to the steering wheel, that bus hits a pothole and throws them out the back. So that feeling that you just can't get control, this profit or lack thereof, you're just you or your franchisees. I want you to be thinking about if you're with a brand, think about your franchisees as well here too, as well as yourself. So you can kind of think of all the stakeholders in your business as you're you're noodling on this stuff. The profit or, or lack thereof, right? You're just not, you're not, or your franchisees aren't getting the profit that you feel is commensurate with the investment of time, of energy, of capital that you're pouring into the business. People, right? As long as we're not dominated by a world of AI, which, you know, we might not have much time left for that. But as long as there are people in a business, I'll always have a job. People are just frustrating. Nobody gets it like you do. Nobody understands. Nobody cares as much. You know, not not your partner, not your colleagues or your your peep, your teams, not your kid or your wife, not the guy who cut you off on the highway on the way to work. People are always a, a, going to be a frustration. And then there's this feeling that you're hitting the ceiling, right? When you're first starting a business or when your franchisees are first getting off the ground, it's all nothing but excitement. Things are going well. You're getting customers. You're building, you're selling units. People are succeeding. And then all of a sudden you bump up against the ceiling. And that can happen organizationally. That can happen at a departmental level, and that certainly can happen for an individual leader. I've seen it happen time and time again where leaders feel like they're being sucked into the weeds of the business, and they just cannot ever remove themselves enough to operate as true leaders in the business. And then you hit that ceiling, and nothing's working, right? You're watching every Simon Sinek video and you know reading every leadership book that people are recommending. You're throwing every spaghetti at the wall, hoping a meatball sticks. If nothing works for too long, you risk becoming a flavor of the month company or a flavor of the month leader. So these are, if you've ever felt or feel currently any of these frustrations, you are certainly not alone. So what EOS was built for was to, to really help answer and solve for those frustrations and help entrepreneurs and leaders live what we consider to be an ideal entrepreneurial life. What does that look like? It's really doing what you love to do with people around you who believe in the same things you do, who share your DNA and that you really enjoy being around and working together with, making a huge difference in the world, whatever that difference means to you, right? It could be employing a ton of people and, and empowering their dreams. It could be for your franchisees, putting you know gifts under the Christmas tree and sending their kids to college. Could be making a great big difference in the lives of the customers of your franchisee. Whatever a difference, whatever that difference means to you, giving you the ability to, to make that impact in the world, being compensated appropriately for your investment, the value you give to the world, getting that value back and having the time in your life to pursue anything else you might be interested in so that you're not all consumed by your business. All right? That's really what the uh, an ideal entrepreneur looks like for, for EOS, for me, and ideally for the people I work with. So, I'm going to walk you around this model. So the first model, first walk is the what. And, and really this model is, is based on what we, kind of the lens through which we view everything in your business. We call it the six key components. And those one out of 20 businesses that Gino had that experience with that had the sense of balance, they were what we call strong in each one of these six key components. 
that allowed them to make progress every day, really achieve and march in unison towards the achievement of a clear and compelling vision with that sense of balance. So our mission today is to give you tools to help you get what we call strong in each one of these six key components. So first pass, again, the what, what are each one of the six key components? Second pass, I'm going to walk you through where we're going to spend most of our time, the two primary tools or disciplines within each component. So what are those components? Vision. And again, these are, this is not anything revolutionary faddish, right? These are fundamentals. This is the blocking and tackling of, of, of any business. Vision's about getting a line on exactly where you're going as an organization and how you're going to get there together. Second component is people. And people's really about cutting through all the jargon and fancy terms around high potential and top performer and superstar, really getting to heart of what makes for a great person in your unique organization for your unique culture. Third component is data. And that's about running the business on a key set of objective facts, figures, and information, a lean and mean set that is more, more enabling than it is numbing. And then versus the ego, the subjectivity and the emotion that drives decision-making at so many organizations. And once you're really strong in vision, people and data, you start to have this transparency, have this lucidity in your organization where you start to see underneath those 130 symptoms, get down to the root of your issues. And that leads us to the fourth component, that's issues. And you just cannot run a world-class organization until you are world-class at being able to identify issues on the horizon and knock them down as they arise forever for the greater good of the business. Fifth component is process. What I like to call the sexy component. And I mean that totally sarcastically. I am a pure visionary. So for me, when I ran a team of people, I always associated process with putting a chokehold on creativity, right? I manage humans, not robots. When I got into EOS, started to understand what good process looks like, I learned it's just doing the most important things the right way every time by everyone. And when you use process, that's not these painful 700 page SOP manuals that nobody can read because it's the definition of pain and suffering, but actually use real process that people can follow. It creates more accountability, more simplicity, more revenue, more profit, and, and even, more fun, even more fun. And last but certainly not least is traction. It's no mistake that traction's at the polar opposite of vision because traction's all about bringing the vision down into the business every day and executing with accountability and discipline. It's about harnessing all the human energy in your company. So all the arrows are pointed in one direction, lockstep progress every quarter, every day, every year towards the achievement of that vision. Right. Vision without traction is hallucination. It is just a dream unless you execute. So how many of you heard me go through all this and say, this is some business 101 stuff, right? No kidding. I get it. I wish everyone around me got it too. Like, this is simple. Well, that's exactly what I thought when I first read traction. And, and guess what? If that's what you think, I'm coming for you. Because you've got to be accountable. You've got to execute. You've got to stay disciplined. You've got to be, you've got to be great at identifying issues on the horizon and solving them forever, right? Uh, for me, EOS was a big kind of self, uh, an opportunity to reflect on the things that where I maybe wasn't strong and get better in those things using this, these tools and this framework and this context. So again, just be honest with yourself about areas where you're, you can improve. Now we measure progress, let me move my head here, on a scale of zero to 100%. Our goal, one of the criteria that I use to, to graduate my clients, because when I work with clients, I, I, my goal is for them not, I don't want to be a crutch, I want them to master EOS and they don't need me any longer, is 80% plus strong in each one of these components. We know that 100% is utopia, it's a fiction, doesn't exist. So 80% is a, kind of our benchmark for excellence. Truth be told, most companies are operating at 20% doing the grind, the late night, the weekends, kind of succeeding in spite of themselves, just thanks on their sheer will and commitment and effort. And this is based on data from all those 23,000 businesses doing a, a self-assessment when they're further along the journey and measuring where they were when they started. And it's worth noting that these are not turnaround companies. These are good companies that just want to be great. And those good companies are starting at 20%. 
So 80% is the benchmark. By the way, if anybody wants to do a self assessment of your own organization right now, just shoot me a note. My contact information will be there. I'll send you a link so that you can take a, what we call an org checkup. It's five minute questionnaire and you can get your own score for how you're, where, where you feel your organization is currently at. Okay, so let's dive into the tools. First one we're gonna tackle is vision. Vision is about answering eight very simple questions that are compiled in, a, in an artifact, a document, a simple two-page document that makes up the vision of your organization for all to see, to share with everyone, to align everyone on what the vision is. Now, there is no magic in any of the questions themselves. Like everything else, EOS, it's painfully simple. The magic is in the alignment when a leadership that's created, when a leadership team gets together and answers every question, discusses and debates, and does not move on to the next question until every single leader agrees to every single word to the answer preceding it. it ensures that alignment. And if somebody just can't get on board, it's, it reveals maybe that person just isn't there for, for the journey with you, right? So let me go through what those questions are. And then I'll spend some time diving into each one. So what are your core values? What's your core focus or your sweet spot? What's your 10-year target? Or for those Jim Collins fans in the audience, what's your BHAG, your big, hairy, audacious goal? What's your marketing strategy? What's a three-year picture look like for the organization? What's that canvas that you can paint where we're going to be in the next three years? A one-year plan, quarterly rocks, and an issues list. So before we dive in, I want to provide you, a, a, give you a story about the power of this document. So when I went to boot camp, so EOS has a, 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 a several days of pretty intense training uh, for us new implementers, part of our franchise agreement, right? We have to go through this training to go out into the world as an implementer. I learned about a version of this called the family or personal VTO, which looks 90% the same of what you're looking at now with some tweaks and nuances built for a familial versus a business leadership team. So I come home from boot camp. I'm exhausted, but energized. I'm drinking the EOS Kool-Aid. I'm bleeding orange. I have a copy of the personal uh, VTO in my hand, and I say to my wife, let's do this. I think it'd be great for, for us and our family. I think it's good kind of practice for me. You should understand. You've so graciously supported me going off into another entrepreneurial venture and leaving this steady job. So I want you to be involved. So first Saturday, I'm home. We we put our, our young son down to bed. We crack open a bottle of red wine. We sit down at the kitchen table and we start answering these questions. And, and let me preface by saying my wife is awesome. I, I way out kicked my coverage with her. Um, I think I just kept her pleasantly buzzed for about six months. And then when I proposed at a karaoke bar, uh, she said yes and woke up the next day and saw the ring on her finger and was like, what, what just happened? So I'm, I'm a very lucky guy. Uh, we have a great relationship. She's my best friend. It's not perfect. No relationship is, but certainly the biggest blessing in my life is her, her and my son. Right. So, but we started going through these questions and it quickly became apparent that not only were there questions that we had never really thought about, but that there were actually fundamental foundational pillars in our life that we didn't agree on. And, and, we were living, it became quickly apparent, we were living very reactive lives, right? Bouncing around from one thing to the other, really not having any North Star to help us make decisions about what to say yes to and what to say no to. One event, work thing, travel trip, vacation, kid thing to, to the next. We were not living lives of intention. So as we worked our way through answering these questions, we started to formulate that North Star for our family, the decision-making filters. And really, what are the values that we want to use to make decisions and to instill with intention in, in our son as we raised him? And we walked away from that kitchen table about an hour and a half later with a really nice solid wine buzz and, and more alignment than we had ever had as a couple. And not, not like a friendship or romantic connection, but real alignment about what we were going to use to orient ourselves and make decisions and live with intention. So what this document did for us as a couple, it does for leadership teams. <clears throat> so let's get into each section. First question, what are your core values? All right, everyone's familiar with core values. 
it's kind of got a bad rap over the, the, the last couple of decades because core values have become kind of watered down and commoditized. Example of that. Um, for those of you on this call who are over the age of 40, you are probably all familiar with the companies Enron WorldCom. Right? Two of the most corrupt history companies in the history of corporate America. They both they shared a, a explicitly stated core value, integrity. Right? That's that's a kind of a, a, a BS value, right? Probably a marketing slogan. So core values are the characteristics of the culture that you're trying to build. When we get into the people section of the people component, we're going to talk about how you bring core values to life to attract the kind of people who believe in the same things you do, who share the fundamental tenets and principles that are, you know, intrinsic to your DNA and to really to repel the kind that, that don't share those values. Now, I'm going to add a little uh, bonus here. There are three, if you don't have a core values, set of core values, or if you want to kind of stress test your current core values, there are three filters that you can use. So it's almost like running your core values through coffee filters and seeing what pops out at the other side to ensure they're right. The first is aspirational, and that is something like integrity. It's trying to solve a known problem. So at Enron and WorldCom, I would argue that at best, those were aspirational values, right? They knew they had an integrity problem. If anyone knew who was going on at that company, so those companies saw, saw that, they probably it bred cynicism and mistrust of, of the leadership. Probably was more marketing fluff, but really your values need to be who you are today, not built to solve a problem. The second is accidental. Values that may have sprung forth organically as the company grew, but will not get you to where you want to be. They got you to where you are today, but they have not been fostered and cultivated with intention. Like I have a buddy who he, he started a company and they were churning 50% of their new employees within the first 90 days. And they had a core value of performance that nobody ever talked about, but everyone knew about. And it was killing them, right? It drove them. It got them to where they are, but it was, it was causing them to churn great talent and burn out their leadership. I mean, one of their leaders had a panic attack on the couch in his office and had to call an ambulance. And that incident actually convinced their CEO to kind of step off the gas pedal a little bit. So accidental values that really need to be fostered and cultivated with intention. And the third filter is called permission to play, which is kind of like the minimum acceptable standards for any business doing, any professional business working in your industry. It's kind of table stakes. Right. It's not it's like generic. It's it's watered down. It's not truly unique, like integrity or maybe cares about the customer. Right. Sometimes those permission to play values can apply, but only if they're so strongly a part of your culture, you can't not say them. Like if if you show up, if your franchisees are showing up to your customer's hospital side bed when they've broken an ankle with a bouquet of flowers, customer centric probably needs to be a value. But really, it has to stand out really something that's true to who you are. So aspirational, permission to play, accidental, those are filters to help you identify whether or not your values truly are who you are and, and what make you different. Okay, next. Any questions on core values? Let me make sure we stop and pause. And Sydney, feel free to shout out when people, guys, put your questions in the chat and we'll take plenty of pauses and have opportunities to pose them or unmute your mic if you have a question and you wanna fire it off. All right, barring any questions on core values, core focus, it's your sweet spot. For those of you who play tennis or softball or baseball, you know if you hit the, hit the sweet spot of the ball, it goes further, faster, straighter, right? As a company and a business grows, if you're a platform company, as you bring on more brands, if you're a franchisee from day one to you know five years down in the future, when you have multiple brands and multiple units, there's going to be sexy stuff, shiny stuff that comes across your path that can potentially distract you and cause you to spend time, money, and energy outside of the things you love to do and what you can be best in the world at doing. So there are two components here. You might've heard a mission statement or hedgehog concept. We call it core focus. It's your purpose, cause, or your passion. It's the why you do what you do. It's what underlies everything and your core competency or your niche. 
How do you manifest your why and bring it to life in the products and services you offer? And as a leadership team, when you discuss and debate, what is it that we love to do and what can we be best at the world at doing? It will always keep you oriented in your sweet spot as you grow, right? It kind of gives internal marching orders to the team so that it's a real decision-making North Star. I, I was part of a, a company when I was a young leader, an early employee, we went public, we went to a billion dollar market cap, um, did not have a core focus. And we had this amazing core product around local pay-per-click advertising that was a world beater. But the company then started to go outside of its sweet spot and bought a Groupon competitor and started a social media platform for small businesses and did a couple of other kind of side businesses. Company really lost its way, almost got delisted off the NASDAQ. And, and ultimately sold for pennies on the dollar. And in my heart of hearts, I know that if that company had a core focus that kept the leadership team aligned, making decisions to stay in their sweet spot, the whole trajectory of that company might've been different. So that's what a core focus can do for you, should do for you. 10-year target, your biggest business goal. It is the BHAG, the big, hairy, audacious goal, right? Jim Collins wrote a book, author of Good to Great. There's a lot of Jim Collins that runs through EOS. He also wrote a book called Built to Last, where he and his team of grad students studied all these publicly traded companies that were outperformed the markets by multiples that had been around as kind of legacy companies. They wanted to understand the common threads that ran between those organizations. What did they do differently? And what he discovered was invariably, every one of those companies had these massive jaw dropping, like hit you right in the, in the center of your chest, BHAGs that really oriented the whole team kind of got them all marshaled that energy that we are on this journey, doing something great, a part of something bigger than ourselves. We know what the mountaintop, what the championship looks like. And it serves as really a catalyst to stimulate continued forward progress towards the achievement of that goal. It should feel like a stretch, but it is the number one thing that you want from your business. Should be, we call it 10-year target because that's what most EOS businesses pick as their time horizon. Could be five, could be 30. Then it changed to core target. It's just, there has to be specific date, exactly when it's going to happen and what that goal is. Now, it could be quantitative. It could be qualitative. It could be a mix, right? I've worked with franchisees where it's some combination of revenue and EBITDA and I want to be working five hours uh, a week from a beach in Isla Mujeres while my son and my daughter runs, run the business, right? That could, that's a really tangible 10 year target. So we call it smart. It's got to be spe specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time bound. So what I'm going to do right now, if you don't have a 10 year target, I'm going to put five minutes on the clock and I want you to think about it for your business. What is your number one goal? specific date you want to achieve it by and how are you going to measure it how are you going to know you've achieved it so for those who have one this could be a good time for a bathroom break but let's take five minutes and we'll come back and then i want i want uh, volunteers to share their bhag okay so five minutes starting now And I'm going to go refill my water.
By the way, a lot of franchisees that, that I've worked with have two versions of this. They have a 10-year target for themselves and their family if their family's involved in the business. And, th and then they have one that they share with their employees that's more explicitly about, about the business goals. So And remember, it should be specific, right? When you, from a time perspective, the month and the year, ideally. So by February of 2034, and the goal should be specific so that when you reach that time, it's crystal clear to anybody who you share it with, whether it's been achieved or not. Right? It's very objective. There's There's little room for debate. It's not murky. It's not ambiguous. We either, we got there and did it or we didn't. All right, a couple minutes left. And feel free to put it in the chat or unmute your mic when we hear it with a minute and share it. And I will uh, I'll share it with the group if it's in the chat. And I'll share with you what mine is too. All right, that is five minutes. So who is willing to be the brave one and share your 10 year target? All right, Yolanda. February 1st, 2034, 10 million EBITDA. That is just beautiful, right? Crystal clear. There is a line in the sand. You will have crossed it or not by that date. Nicely done. Any other, Anybody else want to share? Either unmute your mic or, or drop it into the chat. Unmute. Diane, we can hear you. It's a little tinny. No, we can't. Pop it in the chat. No, we can't hear you. Well, while while Diane's doing that, any other any other? Come on, we need one more beyond uh, size. Diane and the Yolanda. Well, as you're mulling out, I'll share with you mine. So I have it on the whiteboard that I'm looking at on the other side of my office wall, and mine's a little different because I'm a solopreneur, right? This business is being an EOS implementer is implicitly one that's a, kind of a, a a one man or woman show. So mine is 80 plus percent strong, right? I use 80 plus percent financial professional and physical independence or freedom. Because I know, and to me, I have, I have quantitative criteria attached to what that means from a net worth perspective, from the things that I want to be able to do physically, because I still, I'm in the best health I've been in, in over a decade, but I still battle some of those, those chronic issues that I first got when I was cranking those 80 hour weeks. I look at it every day and I ask myself in the morning, are the decisions that I'm going to make today going to set me back or further? It's November, 2031. 
or put me further along the path to achieve these things. So I use it to kind of help help reorient me on why I'm doing it and, and what decisions I'm going to make to help get me there. All right, Diane. Personal, 10 years from now, leave my career with enough money to see the world for as long as it is viable. This will require maintaining current income. Thus, my next next position will need 5% equity. Beautiful. 10 years from now, you're going to see the world. You're going to go travel the world. Not surprising about you. Uh, and I love it. I love it. All right, Ashley, February 2034, location president and multiple person franchise development team in place. Spending five to 10 hours a week on providing vision and inspiration for the company towards continued growth and innovation. Really good, Ashley. The one uh, tweak that you might want to make there Define what multiple person dev team looks like, right? Because that could be two people or more. So say five plus people, 10 plus people. So when you get there, there's absolutely zero room for interpretation about what, what that team needs to look like in terms of how big it is. Five to 10 hours a week, I'm providing vision. I love it. Good job. And Diane's for the company. I work for help a company to 10X and sell for then current day appropriate multiple such as I did with JBS. Well done with JBF, uh, a client of mine too, and big fan of Shannon's and the whole team. Um, good job, guys. So let's, before we move on, a couple final thoughts about 10-year uh, target. One, circulate and socialize it. Make it real. Share it with the people in your life who care and want to help you. Certainly share it with your team, but also, oh, thanks, Diane. But share it with your friends, your family. Get it out of your head so it's not just a dream. People who love and care about you want to help you. They want to see you achieve it. It also makes it real. You start to make commitments. And you can't just let yourself slide. The other thing I'll say is use it to stimulate that entrepreneurial spirit, right? As leaders and entrepreneurs, we have wild swings in our emotions. One day we wake up and we can feel like the luckiest guy or gal in the world to have the opportunity to do what we do. And the next day we wake up and, and are like, why am I doing this to myself? So on those rough days, remind yourself of why you're doing it and use your 10 year target to get the blood stirring again, to reignite the flame of passion that you have for this business. And I promise you it'll, it'll kind of be a, it'll stimulate the blood flow again, you know, the passion you have. Because you got to keep it burning bright. Okay, let's move on. Marketing strategy. Multiple components here. And if you, have, if you had to distill it to its most simple essence, it's who you're talking to and what you're saying to them. All right. So you can't be all things to all people. And if you try to take a shotgun to your market, you're going you know, to not have an impact. You need to take a laser, a rifle shot to reaching to marketing and speaking to only the audience that would benefit the most from being a franchisee or being a customer of one of your franchisees, right? That is your ideal customer. It's usually one and the same with the franchisees that have the biggest success, the greatest validation, make your item 19 look amazing, right? The customers that are lifelong customers and biggest referral sources and most appreciative that's one and the same with who you should be talking to, the ones who benefit the most. Imagine that you had a list of every potential new franchise candidate or your, your franchisee had a list of every customer in their exclusive marketing territory, and you ran it through the demographics, the psychographics, uh, the geographics of what would make for a perfect customer and out pops this list worth the, its weight in gold. And once you identify that list, you have to, you have precious finite sales and marketing resources. So you need to channel all that energy talking to that audience and that audience only. And if, what are you saying to them? There's a combination of three things. Your three uniques are the three things combined that make you a obvious and better choice as a franchise opportunity or, a, or for a customer, the better choice to go service their home or get a massage than any other competitor. The three things combined, because maybe most or all of your competitors can say they offer one of those three things. Maybe a handful offer two, but nobody other than you can offer all three. And that's what uniquely resonates in the hearts and minds of your target audience. That should be the common thread that runs through all your marketing, all your discovery days, all your, your sales calls. Everyone in the company should be able to recite those things by heart because it's what makes you special. 
Next is your proven process and your guarantee. And not every EOS company has these two things, only if it's really pertinent to your business. A proven process is typically a one page, full color illustration of what the customer journey looks like from start to finish. And, and if it's an ongoing thing where you're taking care of your customer, it just shows that you have a buttoned up, proven replicable way to make the customer happy at every stage. And it just shows it ain't your first rodeo. And it also gives internal marching orders to your team so that they're not reinventing the wheel every time they onboard a new customer. And again, one page, full color illustration. Super simple. And then the last element, and this is the one that's most sort of open to, uh, you know, open to interpretation if you want to have one or not, a guarantee. The only reason to have a guarantee is if it helps you win more business. A guarantee is a way to get out in front of an objection and make a customer or a new franchisee feel more comfortable about having a business relationship with you. It's a way to preempt an objection. A good guarantee has teeth meaning that there are consequences if you don't fulfill your end of the bargain. I have a guarantee in my implementation practice. It's There's no contracts, no commitments. You don't move on to the next session that I conduct with you unless you, unless you had a great experience in the last one. And I don't expect a fee, my fee to be paid until after the session and only if a client feels like they got value, right? That has teeth. There are consequences if I don't deliver value and it makes my new clients feel more comfortable about committing, knowing they're not on the hook for something that's not going to give them the benefits that they're willing to invest in. So that's a really good guarantee. Now you can water it down a little bit and call it a commitment or a pledge or a promise if you want to take some of the teeth out of it. So that's a great marketing strategy. A lot of franchises that I work with have two, one for their franchise candidate, one for their that they give to their franchisees to help orient the franchisees marketing around how to, how to reach and speak to customers. So once you know who your core values, you know who you are and your heart of hearts, uh, you know, when, you know why, you, why you do what you do and what you can be best in the world at with your core focus, your sweet spot. You know exactly where you're going with your, your core target. You know how you're going to get there with your marketing strategy. Now we start to get a little more into execution with the three-year picture. Now, we don't believe there is ROI in this exhaustive multi-day, you know, thousand sticky notes on the wall to quarter by quarter planning session because the world moves too fast for an entrepreneurial business. You know, you don't have a crystal ball that works. So we take a high level entrepreneurial approach to creating a simple three-year picture, what the business will look like in three short years. So when we do the exercise, it should take about 45 minutes if you do this with your team, future date. Revenue and profit predictions, maybe one or two measurables that are designed to share with your team beyond money, a number of units, a number of territories, a uh, number of customers, number of franchisees. It could be any number of things that that's just the way to kind of marshal everyone's energy around something beyond money to achieve. And then what does it look like as five to 15 descriptive bullet points combination of qualitative and quantitative that paint the picture of what the business will look like in three years. Now, there are three primary benefits to this. One, it crystallizes the same image in everyone's mind's eye. And when everyone has that same image, the odds of you achieving it are exponentially greater. Two, when you share it with your team, it helps them see their place in that envisioned future. Do I want to be on this journey Am I a part of the ride? Am I excited? And oh, what of these things can I see myself contributing to or really leaning into? So it, it helps create that picture that your employees can get excited about. And the ones that are not excited, well, you're better off if they choose to part ways. And, and the third real benefit is it sets you up for great one-year planning because now you can start to kind of back out. Where do we need to be in a year to be on track to, to achieve our three-year, to on track to, to achieve our 10-year? That leads us now we're really into the execution stage of this one year planning, same framework around future date, revenue and profit predictions, measurables beyond money, and then three to seven absolute do or die priorities to make this a great 12 months in the life of this organization. Three to seven, less is more. When everything is a priority, nothing is a priority. I say this so often to my clients that they start rolling their eyes at me. And when they roll their eyes, that's when I know it's starting to resonate. 
our habit as entrepreneurs and leaders to keep piling more and more and more on. So this is a forcing function to, to generate, to stir the, the pot and generate discussion and alignment about what are the three to seven things that if we get done, we're going to have an awesome year and we're going to celebrate by the end of the year. Then we get into rocks. Now it's now we're living in a 90 day world. So now we're looking at where do we need to be over the next 90 days to be on track to achieve our, our, our three to seven one year goals. Same framework with three to seven priorities for the quarter, for the company and for each department. And you see the who for the leader who is responsible for, for, for uh, leading that department to drive accountability. Some of you might be familiar, this actually, this term comes from a Stephen Covey thought exercise. There are actually YouTube videos about this kind of a man on the street kind of thing. And there's like a container, a glass cylinder. And if you fill the cylinder up with pebbles and sand and glass, you try to put a big rock in, the rock doesn't fit. Pour out all the, the pebbles, the sand, the glass, put the rock in first, pebbles, sand, glass, all fit. And the container all fills it perfectly. So the analogy is, the container is your capacity. The rocks are the real strategic objectives that will move you forward towards the achievement of your vision. And the pebble, the glass, the sand, it's the fire drills, the minutia, the day-to-day -day stuff that's coming across your desk. If you keep the important things visible and in focus all the time, you'll get them done. And all the other stuff that fills your day, that those 12 hours of chaos, you know, that, that'll all fit around that container perfectly. And then last but certainly not least is an issues list. It's a parking lot. There is real therapy to get all the stuff out of your head that might be a priority in a future quarter or future year, but does not need to occupy any real estate in your brain, your collective brain over the next 90 days. You won't forget it. You, you establish a cadence and a rhythm and a discipline to come back at every quarterly planning cycle and start with the discussion about the next quarter's priorities by looking at your long-term issues list. So it's just a way to get it out of your head into a place where you know it'll be waiting for you when you do your next quarter's plans. So once you have that vision, it's a simple two-page document, then you gotta tell them, right? It can't stay in the heads of your leadership team. There's not to get all kumbaya -ish on you guys, but there's a real magic. The stars really can align when there's transparency. When everyone in your organization knows the whys, not just the what's, and they all feel like they're a part of your journey and you want to pull them into that, 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 that journey with you. And they know their contribution towards the achievement of it. I worked for that, that big Fortune 50 company for a few years. Inevitably, every year we'd have this annual meeting. All the leaders would get up on stage, DJ, open bar, and they'd announce the five big initiatives for the next year. Tons of fanfare. And then without fail, like four months later, there'd be all these decisions made in the quiet of night, no fanfare, barely any announcement that were totally running counter to all the stuff they announced four months before. And there was all these whispers and water cooler talk. And what's that? That doesn't make sense. You know, stay in your lane. Who cares? It's not our problem. Collect your check, right? That's toxic. So when you share it with people and pull them in, you create that esprit de corps, that locker room kind of championship foxhole mentality that's rare in the business world. That's how, that's world-class teams. All right, that's what 100% strong looks like in vision. Speaking of world-class teams, we're gonna get into the people component next. And we spend most of our time on vision and people. We'll fly through the rest of this. Any questions or thoughts on vision? And oh, we can always circle back. There's Q&A at the end. And if we don't get to any of your questions, I promise I'll get to you after the, the webinar too. All right, let's get into people, guys. So more Jim Collins for you. For you uh, good to great fans, you've probably heard of the concept of white, right people uh, in the right seats on the bus. So what EOS does is it takes that concept, the right people, right seats, and creates actionable tools to help leaders build and maintain teams of right people, right seats. Peter Drucker said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Culture comes from your people. So having a great team of people and right seats, right? You can, you'll beat any of your competitors with the best strategy in the world. If you have all people who believe in the same things, share the same values and are being held accountable for excellent performance. So let's talk about the right people tool. It's a tool called the people analyzer. 
painfully simple. In the top columns, you start by writing your values. So these are the EOS values. Humbly confident, grow or die, help first, do the right thing and do what you say. By the way, just a quick aside here. First time I ever talked to Barb, the, the franchise sales director who sold me my franchise with EOS. This is the first thing she covered with me at the EOS core values. And when I did my due diligence and talked about eight implementers before I decided to pull the trigger, I really asked them questions to see if they embody these values. And I can say without fail that part of the joy I get from doing this is working with clients and helping other businesses succeed and live better lives and get more of what they want. But it's also this community of 750 people who truly live these values. And I've made everyone shares these things. It's really part of everyone's DNA. And I have mentors and mentees and lifelong friends as a result. It really makes this, the EOS community special. Should do the same thing for your franchise system. So the way you stress test your values, use this tool and write the name of yourself. Write your very worst team member. And again, this is just a test. And write your best team member. And then the, the, the rating criteria, the evaluation criteria we use is super simple. Plus means they show up in a way that's aligned with those core value, that core value most of the time, right? Again, you're, these are people, not robots. Nobody's perfect, but most of the time they're, they're showing up in a way that embodies that value. A minus means they're failing to show up in a way that is aligned or in accordance with the value. And a plus minus is their borderline. Maybe you can identify examples of where they have and where they have it and use that to coach them up so that they really have tangible feel for what it is, what it means to really ex ex exemplify that value. And they, and they can learn from it and get better. What you'll end up with is a visual snapshot that will show you who are your real superstars, the real, real people fits, who are the ones that you, you might want to invest in coaching up and who are your terrorists, you know? Maybe Jalen is hitting his numbers and performing, but there's just something about him that you can't quite put your finger on. And, you know, you're staying up at night, blinking at the ceiling, thinking about what is it about Jalen? And he's sleeping like a baby because he's hitting his numbers. He thinks everything's hunky-dory. So this gives you a tool to facilitate a conversation where you can extract examples of each value and have a disciplinary conversation or even a termination conversation that doesn't feel as emotionally fraught or subjective, right? You can use this to create, to facilitate an objective conversation. It also is a phenomenal hiring tool because regardless of whether you're hiring for an intern or a, a COO or president, everyone needs to exemplify your core values. So you can create a series of interview questions to help uncover whether or not your candidates share your values or not. Now, the next stage of this is you have a bar. It's a minimal acceptable standard or threshold of a combination of plus plus minuses that mean that you're a right person or not, any combination. So if you have five core values, our recommendation is any combination of three pluses, two plus minuses, no minuses. That's your bar. That is your standard. No matter what seat or role in the organization, they have to meet the bar, three pluses, two plus minuses. That's what makes for a right person. Now you can set the bar higher if you want, but you don't want to, you know, make it impossible to hire the perfect person. If you set it too low, kind of makes it a mockery. So there has to be some sort of rigor and discipline around. We we hold everyone to this standard of behavior. Now you see those three columns on the right. That's where we fill in with the, the right seat tool. Meaning, are they good at their job? So let's talk about that. Really subtle distinction, but important here, because what we're about to review is going to look an awful lot like an org chart, but it is not, it's an accountability chart. Org charts are typically take the people that you have and their titles, plug them into a reporting hierarchy. This is very different. We start by removing the faces from the functions. So when I do this with my clients, the, the approach is you're all fired. Like let go of your history, let, let go of your ego, let go of your title. We think titles are, are awful because for the outside world, maybe they need to have a title to know what people do. But internally, VP this and senior director that, it creates ego and self-interest and politics. 
what we care about is what what structurally who does what responsible for what in the business no title but what is each seat responsible for and how can we take that structure first approach inject accountability simplicity and clarity about where one function stops and another starts who's responsible for what right so to get you to the next level of where you want to grow. When we build this for an organization, we typically say, imagine we want to implement this today to get you to the next 12 months of growth. So walk you through this basic framework is every company has some combination of marketing and sales, right? How you're out there closing business ops, how you're delivering your products and services, finance, admin, HR, IT, M and a money flowing in and out of the business. We start by customizing at this level. Maybe marketing and sales breaks off into its own departments or functions. Maybe uh, franchise support is its own department. Typically, rule of thumb is somewhere between three and seven. Then there is this additional seat, that of the integrator. The integrator is the person who beats the glue. Excuse me, beats the drum. They're the glue. They are in charge of execution. All the departmental heads report to the integrator. The integrator ensures that there is alignment. Everyone is ro rowing in the direction of the achievement of the vision. They are, they are minutia, right? They're the head of the accountability. And then there is this additional seat called the visionary. Visionaries are typically founding entrepreneurs, creative problem solvers, strategic thinkers, Great with big relationships. Come to every meeting with 20 ideas. 19 of them are totally wacky off the wall, but one of them is going to you know, create the next 10 years of, of growth, high, hockey stick growth for the company. Visionaries often get trapped in the integrator seat because who else is going to do it? And if that happens for too long, a visionary will burn out, first of all. And secondly, the business will go through a lot of 90-day spikes because a visionary gets genuinely excited about some new idea gets everyone, so, circulates, socializes, gets everyone energy pointed on pursuing that idea, but can't maintain focus and discipline. 90 days later, they'll have some other idea and there's a lot of organizational whiplash and bridges built to nowhere. And frankly, cynicism that's created. And accidentally, right? I'm a visionary and it's like, oh, Justin read this new leadership team book or went to the Disney Institute of Learning and wants us all to create our dream sheet and you can just ignore it because he's going to forget about it in two months because I'll have some other idea. So if a visionary gets tra trapped in that integrator seat, bad stuff starts to happen. If you have a visionary integrator, you've got to crystallize and call it out and create five unique roles or accountabilities that the visionary has in the business relative to the unique five roles that the integrator is responsible for. Really crystallize and clarify that for everyone. For me, the whole visionary integrator dynamic was an epiphany when I read Traction because when I was getting sick and working 80 hours, I was trying to be an integrator and I am not. It's, I think, in large part what got me sick because I was burning myself out and, and unhappy. And I thought I was a deficient leader. And this, this description of the visionary integrator was the first thing I had seen that said, you know what, not only is it okay but you should lean into being a visionary because that's where you contribute at your highest and best capacity. And that's what's going to keep your cup full because you can't pour your cup out into other people unless it's full, right? And as much as I love to do and I'm good at the visionary stuff, there are people in the world who feel the same way about the integrator. So it's like finding that real yin-yang partnership. Um, there's a, a website called Rocket Fuel University where you can take a, a test called the crystallizer assessment to determine who you are, or if you're hiring for one of these roles, have them take it to see if they have the capacity to be a, an integrator or a visionary. Uh, ultimately, you're going to create five unique roles for each department. Again, an org chart doesn't have roles, just title. So this is clarity about who is accountable and which department owns what, and the leader that is responsible for that department. Now, how do we fill the seat? We use another crazy simple criteria called GWC. So we have this marketing seat. Marketing and the leader who's responsible for that seat, responsible for LMA, that's kind of the catch-all term for hiring, firing, reviewing, rewarding, and recognizing people. It's, it's the basket term for managing a team, the most important role any leader has. All the marketing in the business, achieving the sales numbers, the activity of selling, and managing accounts. 
And then when we determine if someone's right for any seat, we use this filter. Do they get it? Their synapses fire in the right way. Their neural pathways connect. They just got this unique ability to understand what the job entails, right? You would never hire a graphic designer to be your accountant. You would never hire an accountant to be your graphic designer. They're born on two different universes, right? Want it. They're excited about it. They get out of bed. They never have a case of the Mondays. They want the job and they also want that accountability. They, own, they want to own it. They want to be responsible and capacity to do it. Capacity is the physical capacity, emotional, mental, uh, the training, the, 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 uh, the tools and resources, the time capacity. They have the capacity to, to be accountable for these roles. So do they GWC the seat? So when we go back to the people analyzer, everyone has to meet the bar, whether they're the CEO or COO or the intern or the, you know, the, the facilities maintenance crew. And then for the seat that they're in, do they GWC the seat? So you want to make sure they meet the bar and it's yeses to all question. And that is how you grow and maintain a team of right people in the right seats. Every function, five unique roles or accountabilities. And ultimately you're gonna have an accountability chart that looks something like this. Now, one other rule of thumb, you could have one leader in multiple leadership team seats, but you can never have two leaders in a leadership team seat, right? So Sydney and I could be, uh, Sydney could be the integrator, the head of sales and the head of marketing. That's maybe not ideal. That'll probably give Sydney and the team a good idea of how to grow and where hiring needs are. Like we gotta get Sydney out of sales because she's great at marketing and a great integrator, but this is not her wheelhouse. But Sydney and Diane could never be the head of sales because when two people are accountable, nobody's accountable. It's murky, it's unclear. If an employee doesn't like what one leader has to say, they go to another. Who's really responsible for delivering on the, the roles in the seat and the numbers that atta are attached to them, right? One leader per seat, that is the rule of thumb. Now. As you grow, there's going to be a million different flavors of two essential foundational kinds of people issues. The first is the right person, wrong seat. Somebody who fits your culture like a glove. You love them. Uh, they show up every Monday with a box of donuts and a smile. But nobody knows what they do. Or they're just not being held accountable to objective performance standards. And if you can find a right person who fits your culture a seat in the accountability chart where they can be consistently excellent, then fantastic. If not, for the good of the organization and for the good of that person, frankly, you have to part ways. The other problem is a little harder because it can hit you in the wallet and that's wrong person, right seat. That's someone who's hitting their numbers. They're, they're performing their job, like our friend Jalen, but they are a culture vampire. With every side eye and smirk, they are chipping away at the culture behind the scenes in ways you can't even see. Right. And every time you permit it and condone it because they're superstars, you are chipping away at your own credibility. A players see it and do not want to be a part of a permissive organization where cultures, where values don't mean anything. They're not real and they will quit. You have to get rid of wrong person, right? See people who, who chip away at your culture. I have a, a friend who has a, a, a team of developers that kind of fit this bill. And they created a policy called no brilliant jerks. I'm, I'm making that a little more family friendly than it actually is, right? You have to have right people who are great at their jobs. Use this tool to build and maintain it. I love this diagram. You've got your puppies, fit your core values, and they're just happy, go lucky, but they're not performing. You got your rats who scurry off into a corner anytime a light is shown on them because they're not, they're not uh, aligned with your values. They're not performing. You got your terrorists. Right, those are the ones that are behind the scenes. They're killing it, but they're they're chipping away at your values and making other people quit. And then you got your stars. You want a team of stars who fit your core values and perform at their job. Super valuable. All right, guys, we're gonna fly through the rest of the tools, and then we're gonna get into the franchise use cases. Any questions on people? See one chat here. Diane, okay, you're back, Diane. All right, data. When EOS was created, I think there was a lack of data. Right? There was, uh, it was a long time ago. So leaders had to make decisions based on gut instinct and, and intuition. 
today the pendulum has totally swung, right? We are inundated with so much data from so many different places. It feels like we're looking at the ones and the zeros in the matrix scrolling past our eyes and trying to use all that information to help you make better decisions and tell you a story about your business, almost impossible. So what do most leaders do? We just check the data box. We get all these reports because we feel like we have to. And then you end up going back and relying on your instincts and your, your, your intuition anyway to make decisions. So when we talk about data, we talk about two tools here. I love this quote. If we have the data, let's look at the data. But we have our opinions, let's go with mine. Jim Barksdale, former Netscape CEO. So a scorecard and the measurables that populate that scorecard. A set of five to 15 weekly activity-based metrics, and I'll talk more about activity, leading versus lagging indicators here in a moment, that define what winning looks like every week for the organization, that give you an absolute pulse on the health of the business every week, and that help you identify issues as they arise so you can get out in front of them and make decisions to get you back on track before the ultimate outcome is impacted. So how do we populate this scorecard? We create a set of five to 15, ideally primarily activities-based metrics. The goals should be less about numbers that you aspire to achieve and more about like tripwire kind of early warning systems. Like imagine that you're driving down the highway and you hit the rumble strips, right? The car vibrates and you reorient and get back on the road before you T-bone a tree, get right back on the straight and narrow. So these almost like your rumble strips, helping you course correct before a disaster happens. And then a who to drive accountability. That's the objective measurement of performance ultimately for every seat in the company. But this is a scorecard for the leadership team to drive that accountability. And then you have this 13 week rolling average. So you can identify trends and see a snapshot of what's working and what's not. So when I say leading indicators, let's take a hypothetical example, talent acquisition. Talent acquisition, the HR team is responsible for a certain number of hires every, every month. Now, a lot of teams use reporting or the KPI dashboard metrics report is like a look in the rear view mirror when something has already happened. And it's too late to do anything about it. It's already hit your PL or your balance sheet. So what we want to do is start with the end in mind and back out the steps to get there. So what is the step before a hire? It's an accepted job offer. The step before a job offer, a successful interview. And then we want to do the calculus or the math about how each, how many, what's the volume at each stage to successfully lead to the next stage. Ultimately, you're going to want to dial. It's going to take some work because you want to dial into what the conversion percentages need to be at each stage. But ultimately, we want to pick the upfront measurables that are more activities based. So that number one, somebody can be 100% accountable for them. And number two, if you ever get to a point where maybe one, two weeks in a row, we are at 25 number of apps re received. Now we can address it, problem solve it, and make a decision that will help us get on back on track so that our ultimate goal, the number of hires or the number of right people, right seat is not impacted. So we want a set of more enabling lean and mean five to 15 measurables in that scorecard that can help you identify those issues on the horizon and problem solve and make decisions before those issues become unsolvable, before that's already the, the, impact, the ultimate impact is felt on the business. That is a great measure scorecard. It takes a while to figure it out. It takes a lot of iteration. It's hard, but when you get it down, at t it'll take you six months to nine months to get it to figure out a great scorecard. It's, it's pretty hard. The, the desert island test is the ultimate arbiter. Imagine you're on vacation, you've missed a week. It's week two, you're, you're at the pool, you order a Mai Tai and the cabana girl or boy brings you your drink and a copy of the scorecard. And within 30 seconds, you should have an absolute pulse on how the business is cranking in your absence over the last week. That's a great scorecard. Okay. I said, once you have clarity and vision, people and data, you have that transparency to get under those symptomatic, painful sim symptoms and get down to root issues. That leads us to the issues list. Two primary tools here. 
our issues list and what we call IDS, which I'll explain here in a moment. So I talked about the long-term issues list, that, that parking lot for all the things that maybe down the road you want to think about, but don't need to occupy attention over the next 90 days. You have another issues list too. It's your short-term stuff. Everything that, the, all the ideas, the, the challenges, the obstacles, the opportunities that you need to address within 90 days. This is all part of the weekly meeting cadence or agenda, which I'll kind of, that's where we'll put a bow on all of this is how you meet. But give me some blind faith right now. Every week, your issues list is like a revolving door. Things coming off, things coming on. Problems get solved, new issues pop up. So it is a living, breathing thing that you bring into your weekly meeting. And IDS is the framework that was created to, to help leadership teams and every team in an organization get really world-class at solving problems and collaborating together. It stands for identify. So the trick to the secret to answering a question is asking the right question. So when we get into our weekly meeting, we prioritize what are our top three issues? Because if we only have time to to identify to solve is one issue this week, it's got to be our most important one. So let's take a minute and dig, dig, dig past the root symptom, past the symptom, past how the pain presents itself, and agree on what the root cause is. Let's let's not knee jerk and immediately run at problem solving what might be a symptom. So identify, ask ourselves, is this the root cause? And then discuss and solve. Now discuss is based on a discovery that Gino had, if there's one thing that leadership teams don't need any coaching on, it's endless discussion of the same issues over and over until we're blue in the face over the course of months, in some cases, years, because there's no framework for creating action plans with accountability to solve problems. So we end up just ultimately just talking about the same stuff forever and complaining. In this framework, the discussion should be brief. Everyone's expected to offer their perspective. Nobody should dominate the conversation. Any repetition is considered politicking. Once everyone has offered their perspective, all ideas have been solicited and gained. Then we move to solve. A solve should be specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. Smart. How do we create an action plan where we can be specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. Move the ball 10 yards down the field if it's an issue that requires more than a week with accountability so that when we get back together in next week's meeting, we can say done or not done. So we're moving in lockstep. We're aligned and we're making progress every week. Identify, discuss, solve. It's awkward and clunky at first. I promise you, if you commit to this, this framework, I sit in on my clients and the first time they do an IDS session is kind of clunky and, and weird. Six months later, they're like well-oiled machines, knocking off six, nine issues every week. Get down to the root, everyone offer their perspective, move to solve. One other rule of thumb, consensus management is a deal, a business killer because among a host of other things that it, bad things it gives into the business is inertia. And so the integrator on a leadership team always makes the call. When people don't commit to things, it's usually not because they don't agree. It's because they haven't been solicited for their opinions. So this is a forum where everyone's expected to think, offer their perspective. You have the opportunity to voice your perspective. And even if I can't agree with it, most times people can commit and support a decision if they all feel like it's being made in the greater interest of the collective. So the integrator makes the call when consensus can't be reached. And that's how you become a world-class at solving problems. I love this quote. If I have one hour to save the world, I would spend 55 minutes on defining the problem and only five minutes finding the solution. The great Albert Einstein. Identify the root, then tackle the issue. Okay. Any questions on the issues list? Again, I'm going to tie a, a nice bow on, on this when we get into how you meet. Process. Two tools here, documented and followed by all. Systemize the predictable so you can humanize the exceptional. Isidore Sharp, founder of the Four Seasons Hotel. Luxury hotel, five-star guest experience. Simple set of processes on how to check in a guest, how to turn a room, right? Those functions that require consistency from everyone who touches them. And within that framework, within those guidelines, 
the employees have carte blanche to apply their creativity and their individual skills to re respond to guests to make them happy and create a delightful experience. So you start by identifying a handful of functions that require that consistency. Maybe you have a people function that requires some, some a core set of processes, a marketing function with associated processes, sales, a couple ops, a customer service, an accounting function. And then we really want to simplify and document this. Really what, what account amounts to more of a series of checklists that are one to three pages long versus these massive SOP manuals that really only identify the high level steps and maybe some sub steps for, for the, the process, right? A people process where everyone involved has to follow the same basic process to identify the need, define the seat and the roles. How do we go out into the marketplace and hire? How do we onboard and train LMA, the active management of an employee and then a termination process? Maybe we have the same kind of basic, simple process for a sales function. Again, we are talking one to three pages, just checklists. You manage human beings, not robots. And you as leaders cannot always be stuck being the teachers of routine behavior. So you need to inject process people can actually use and follow so that you can elevate and be a true leader in the business and get out of the weeds. And then you create your way of doing things. Right? Documented in a learning management system or in a Google Drive folder, or if you have people in an office, a, a binder, the old school way. And then you just need to make sure it's followed by all. Use it. Use your process to train all your new employees in the function that they're being hired for. Use it to measure actively, are they living up to standards of performance? Use it in the ongoing management of your employees. And at least once a year, if not more based on any changes happening with the market or technology, the owner of that function should look at the process and make updates accordingly. That's what great process looks like. There's a book in the EOS library called Process. And when EOS released it, they sent us all implementers a, bo a gift box with a copy of the book a and a pair of socks and a card on how to put your socks on. That was inspired by John Wooden, who coached the UCLA Bruins to a dynasty of 11 championships. And this was back in, I think, the 60s, when everyone wore those con uh, canvas Chuck Taylor shoes, and it ripped apart players' feet. Massive blisters. So the UCLA Bruins, at the start of every season, had a well-defined way that they would all get together in the locker room and teach players on how to put your socks on so that you wouldn't get blisters. And it just demonstrated in no uncertain terms we have a way of doing things that gives us a competitive advantage. We pay attention to the details and we all do the important things the right way. And so uh, those are my lucky session socks. I, I wear my process, says process is freedom. Um, all right, any questions on process? Let's wrap a bow on this before we get into the franchise use cases with traction. This is where it all comes home. So two primary tools here, rocks, living in this 90-day world, and running world-class meetings, we call them the L10. So rocks, every 90 days, you are executing, right? You're, you're cranking on your priorities for the company. Each departmental leader has rocks that they own. Every 90 days, we get back together. There's a psychology there. Every 90 days, attention starts to fray. Relationships can start to unravel. Focus can start to go fuzzy. We get back together. We evaluate how did we do so that we drive accountability and what did we learn to help make us better, smarter, and faster predictors and planners in our business. We discuss and debate priorities for the company and for each department for the next quarter. We align on what those priorities are. We use our VTO, making sure that we're on track to hit our one year, our three year, our BHAG, we go back into execution mode. And then running a wonderful, actual effective meeting, a place where productivity doesn't go to die. So five hard and fast rules for running a great meeting. Have to be on the same day. You can't run, play fast and lose with other priorities. It's a sacred time for the leadership team to problem solve together. Same time, respect everybody's time. Early is on time, on time is late, as Vince Lombardi says. Come prepared and ready to rock. Have to start on time. 
There has to be a sense of urgency because there's a, a structured agenda, things we have to get done and you, you can't blow up everybody else's day by running long. And it's like learning a new instrument or, or a sport, you're building muscle memory and you, you, you take some time to get good at this agenda. You have to just keep running it. Every EOS company runs these L10 meetings and it demonstrably materially improves the quality of your meetings. So let's go through what an agenda looks like. This is again, where all the tools work together. Every week for the leadership team, ultimately every department should run a 60 minute L10, but the executive team should run a 90 minute meeting where you start with a bit of good news. Five minutes just to get your head out of in the business, thinking on the business. Good news happening in your life, happening in the business. The next 15 minutes are devoted to the reporting review. I think the other reason why, but me, when I used to run meetings, I thought meetings were terrible. And then I realized it was just my meetings that were so bad because I ran them like a laundry list of all the stuff that happened between last week and this week. So Yolanda, tell me what you did last week. Uh, yeah, you can see it all in the, in the CRM, but here's what I did. Okay, John, what'd you do? It just feels like everyone's huffing and puffing. It's where productivity goes to die. We're checking the meeting box. It feels like someone's checking in on homework. So it, it feels like you don't trust your employees. In this uh, framework, 15 out of 90 minutes reporting reviews. Scorecard, on track or off track, everyone comes in and populates the number. And so you have your finger on the pulse of the measurable, you're responsible. Everyone's responsible for populating the scorecard, saying whether or not it's on track or off track. If it's off track, you drop it down <laughs> to your issues list. And I'll explain the importance of what drop it down here means in a minute. Rock review. Company priorities for the next 90 days, departmental priorities. Every week we are visibility. We're surfacing the things that we've agreed are most important for us on track or off track. Anything off track, drop it down. Why is drop it down such an important piece of vocabulary? Because in our professional lives, in most meetings, we chase the rabbit. Oh, the, the leaf counts off this week. Oh, well, the CRM was down and it's a holiday and, and Madeline was out sick. And next thing you know, you've burned 20, 30 minutes on an issue that may or may not be a high priority that week. And you, you can't get that time back. So when we drop it down to the issues list, now we add it to all the issues we have, that revolving door. And now when we get to the problem solving component, we can look at everything in context and only prioritize and work on those issues we agree are most important to the business. It takes a lot of training and a lot of repetition to get good at that because it's really denying our habit, uh, unwinding patterns of behavior. Next, a quick five minute to-do list some recap. From last week, we had a bunch of to-dos when we solved problems. This week, how many got done? The benchmark is about 90%. Every week, your 90% of your to-dos are to done. Any not done, drop it down to the issues list if it's still an issue. And then 60 minutes to IDS identify, prioritize what are our top issues, identify the root. Everyone offers their perspective. EOS companies expect their employees to think, solve. Integrator makes the call, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, timely. How do we create an action plan with a step forward with accountability? So when we meet next week, we can say, we did these seven to-dos. We all, we agree, we made progress on the most important things. People were accountable for driving that progress. Blood, sweat, tears. Everyone needs to leave that meeting. That's where you have healthy debate. You leave that meeting, one vision, one voice, one team, united front, no cracks in the armor. Because if you disagree, leaders then set your employees to win bloody and unwinnable battles against each other. You have your disagreements hashed out here so that you are a united front and all of your team members are aligned around the decisions that come out of this meeting. It's the most powerful 60 minutes of your week. And then five minutes on a conclusion, three elements here. Summarize the to-dos that came out of this IDS session. Yep, Sydney got it, Diane, I got these two. Ashley, I got these three, check, check, check. Something called cascading messages. Who needs to know what based on the decisions we made? How are you gonna tell them? Maybe you create another couple to-dos. And then the most single powerful element, why it's called an L10 is that everyone independently rates the meeting on a scale of one to 10. Anything less than an eight, why? I gave it a seven because uh, people showed up late and weren't prepared. 
Um, we chased an issue before we dropped it down. You're self-critical. Most bad meetings end and people then have another bad meeting because you never talk about it. So this is an opportunity to talk about it, to record the ratings. Over time, you'll see your ratings go up at, at or just about the averaging a 10 every week as you get good at this. Guys, and that is EOS. It's, it's, it harmonizes and orchestrates all the moving parts of your pieces of your business, creates that common context and language to unleash your entrepreneurial spirit, your innovation, your agility. So before we got 20 minutes left, just enough time to go through uh, the franchise use cases. Then if anybody wants, wants to hang on for after for Q and A, we can. Any questions or thoughts on any of these tools? Okay. Let's get into the franchise use cases. So the franchise playbook. So franchising is a unique animal. Uh, so there are a few use cases I wanna, I wanna go through here. How does a franchise or a brand leverage EOS in the most powerful capacity? How does a franchisor who wants to support the growth of your franchisees and their goals with EOS, what's a framework for that? What's probably the most nuanced of all of these? How can a platform company most powerfully leverage EOS? And how can a multi-unit or a multi-brand franchisee? So let's, let's tackle each one independently. Franchise or brand is super easy. It's pure. Read the book traction, work with an implementer. You can use it like any business would for your corporate team. Typically, there are two target markets. One, a target audience in your, in your vision traction organizer of who is the right ideal franchise candidate, and then another will be your end customer. So you'll have, there's a wrinkle there that's kind of unique. One kind of interesting thing for really any of these use cases that investors, private equity firms, no EOS. I know quite a few, I have partnerships with a few private equity firms, conversations with many who uh, by default, their portfolio companies, they, they inject with EOS and they use whether or not the companies they invest in run on EOS as part of their diligence. It's valuable. So create enterprise value in your business with showing your VTO to demonstrate to an investor exactly where you're going to go and how you're going to get there. It's a powerful tool and it means something to the market. It's pretty cut and dry. Next use case is the most nuanced and there are several elements here that I want to go through. So the traction library, training of your franchisees, foundational tools, software, how to, how to empower and deploy your franchise business coaches, running great IDS sessions and using that support as a way to attract the right franchisees and differentiate who you are, right? So, so many great franchise, EOS is perfect for what the whole mission and ethos of a franchise is, right? Franchise or support for, it's going in business for yourself, not by yourself. So many great franchises offer so much support by way of marketing and software and collective buying and ops manuals, but so many have a blind spot, especially those where there's corporate refugees have cashed in their 401k and are leading and managing people for the first time and just not giving them any kind of basic framework to create a common context in the business that we're all speaking the same language on how to foundationally run and lead and manage people. So this is a way to do that. And so here's some steps you can take kind of methodically to do that. The traction library, mail out copies of traction. What the heck is EOS is kind of the, the basic for employees. Uh, some of the clients I work with, even before I started working with them, they were doing this because they believe in traction. That was kind of the end of the beginning and the end of how they supported, how they were an EOS company. They just mailed out copies of traction. No brainer, not very expensive. And it, it provides real value for your franchisees just to read these books. Step one. Step two, training. Whether it's workshops with someone like myself, or if you have an internal expert on the team providing training, doing just this exact same kind of training that I did for you guys with your franchisees. So they get a download, helping them workshop their 10-year target, helping them understand some of the tools they can use. And I'll get more into the specifics of how you can really reduce the friction and drive adoption here in a moment. And that's in the foundational tools. So you have an opportunity to drive consistency 
real value for your franchisees and, and compliance by kind of preloading and populating some of the tools. What are your core values? You can create element of a, a consistent VTO for all of your franchisees with the elements you want to drive with consistency already populated. What are your core values? What's your core focus? What do you want your franchisees core focus to be? Typically a 10 year target will, will vary for each franchisee. A marketing strategy that you want to drive with consistency. And then a three year picture, you can just create an image or an ideal. Right? Everyone's got different goals. Every franchisee has different reasons for owning your business or owning the business and part of your, being a part of your system. But maybe you want to paint a picture. What's possible? What should they be looking to achieve? What have others who have been successful, where have they been in three years? Paint a picture of what's possible for them. You can use this in your, in your uh, interviews and in your candidate qualification calls to, to, to attract them and kind of an envisioned future for your franchisees. Same with your one-year plan. Where should they be? And where, where do you want them to be? What's possible for them at a year? Uh, first year, maybe the second year, you have a different version. Maybe after two years or when they reach a certain number of employees or units, you have different versions of this. Same with rocks. I have, I have a client who they have a set of initial 90 day rocks that they offer to all their new employees along with an initial scorecard so that when the employee, when, excuse me, when the new franchisee launches their business, they, they don't have to reinvent the wheel. They have suggested rocks from corporate saying, here are the priorities we should focus on because we have a million balls in the air but these are the six things that will help us have a successful launch along with the scorecard that we should use from day one to make sure that we're, we're healthy and growing the business. So you, there's a million different ways you can get creative to use this document to drive consistency and create value for your franchisees. Now you can do the same thing with the accountability chart. What kind of structure do you want is, is ideal for your franchisees? And you can create multiple versions. So when they launch the business, you can have one accountability chart. This is what an ideal, this is what we have seen drive success at launch. And then maybe you offer a, a, an updated or evolved version once they reach year two or they reach a certain threshold of units or revenue. Again, you are driving consistency, protecting your brand, and enabling, giving your franchisees confidence that you have their back at each step of their growth. And, you know, again, now you're sensing a theme here. Scorecard at launch. Scorecard once you reach a certain revenue with the measurables that you should be using to evaluate weekly, hold your team members accountable, and to give you a finger on the pulse. Make sure you're healthy. To define winning. All of these things that at, are within your grasp to create, to add value, encourage adoption, and give and instill a sense of confidence and clarity in your franchisees. Now, how do you push that at scale? Use software. So there are a few different platforms out there. The one that I really like, there's one called Bloom Growth. It's great. EOS is creating its own. 90.io is great. They have um, uh, the only licensed software with EOS. So it's built specifically for EOS businesses. For franchisors, you, they can create a parent-child type of environment where you can have a, a master account. Each one of your franchisees have their own accounts and you can see transparency, who's running L10s, how are they doing on their rocks. Your franchise business coaches can use those accounts to manage, you know, I have my 10 franchisees under my kind of sub account. So it's it's pretty sophisticated how you can layer it and allow for a for a kind of a, a multi-tiered approach. You can then use those tools, consistent scorecard, accountability chart rock, and preload them into the software. So my franchisees log in, they see it there. It's already populated. You can use that to onboard and train. It really helps drive adoption because it reduces friction. Um, I have a client who they, they take a portion of their mandated tech fee from the FDD, a very small portion, and they use that to fund an enterprise deal with, so they're paying uh, 90, and then each of their franchisees automatically have, a, have a, a, an account. And it, like, the cost value is so overboard. The value for the relative cost is just off the charts. And they've seen 
that gives them transparency about who's running EOS, who's not, and all their franchise business coaches are using it. Um, by the way, this QR code is unique to me. So it'll give you a couple of things if you decide to, to test it out, a 30 day free trial, but more importantly, you'll have access to a toolbox. And whether you're a client of mine or not, it doesn't matter if you use that QR code, which I'll bring up again, I'm in the process of shooting custom video tutorials around each one of these tools. So if you or your team, your franchisees, anybody who, who logs in, uh, you will be able to access videos from me providing training on each one of these tools. There are about 20 tools in the tool chart that you can always reference. And again, this is for people who doesn't matter if you're a client of mine or not. If you log in using that QR code, you'll have access to those videos, which I'll be creating over the next month or two. It's a great tool. Your franchise business coaches are going to be the ones who really are kind of the connective tissue between the franchisor and the franchisee. So they're the ones who really need to be pros because they're the ones who should be sitting in on L10s, looking at the agenda of the meetings to see, are they doing a good job IDSing? Are they hitting their measurables and their scorecard? Are they achieving their rocks? This gives insight and transparency to your franchise business coaches, and they should be a part of kind of dripping and training and coaching your franchisees to be great at running a business on EOS. Um, I train a, a, a client of mine, Horsepower Brands. I'm, I'm at their Omaha headquarters every month for their academy, training all their new franchisees. And a lot of their FBCs have sat in on my training half a dozen or more times because they just want to be pros because they're the ones who are really, really responsible for driving EOS adoption and making sure it works for their franchisees. And another element that's powerful is group IDS sessions. A great way, because now you have this common context in this language, everyone understands rocks and scorecard, what IDS means. Your whole system is speaking the same language and can share notes and swap notes. And at annual events, regional events, virtual events, you can facilitate IDS sessions. Again, using someone like myself or someone on your own team who's really good and uh, an expert, an in-house internal EOS expert, collect people's issues in, in advance. And this is what we do at EOS. Every quarter we meet quarterly, we call it the QCE, quarterly collab exchange. And we have 300 people in a room IDSing together a list of a hundred issues and we prioritize and it's a great way to leverage the collective intelligence of everyone's counterparts because 99 times out of hundred, someone's having a challenge or an obstacle. Someone else has encountered it before and can tell them what worked for them. So these collective IDS sessions, it's kind of like group crowdsource content and a ton of value for franchisees to really leverage each other's intelligence and experience in an organized capacity. And you can control, make sure it doesn't turn into a complaint session. You know, a good facilitator can curate the issues and make sure it stays positive. And last, but certainly not least, a sales differentiator, right? For some of my clients, I run an hour webinar like this, but condensed once a month. We're, we're talking about a quick EOS overview and how the franchisee supports the, the, the the franchisees with EOS. It means something to the market. A lot of the franchisees for a lot of systems are coming from businesses that have run EOS or they're familiar with EOS, they've read traction. So you should use the support you offer as a way to differentiate the opportunity and show and demonstrate in a material way your commitment to supporting these. So there's a, a, a lot here and I'm gonna, don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this because it's probably too much for you to absorb this quick overview, but I promise there's a, there's a, there's a resource for you if you wanna capture all that. And, and last but not least is a platform company. So there's this uh, video, I would encourage you just go to YouTube and type Patrick Lencioni, team one. Pat Lencioni, a lot of him, his, his leadership, his thought leadership runs through EOS, all about team health. And a lot of platform companies are like fiefdoms, right? It's a, coll a loose collection of brands that have no relationship to one another other than financial. And so actually running the business as a, a, a true leadership team that is collectively responsible for, passionate about, and committed to the goals of the enterprise is, is hard. So you end up with all these little fiefdoms and shared services and then each brand and it's really kind of a bunch of like disparate parts 
So what EOS can do is create, is be like a catalyst to galvanize the team and create really a team one feeling where all the brand presidents, all the leaders feel like they're part of a collective enterprise, create rocks and goals and a three-year picture that are all about our collective achievement so that we're all in it together. So I, I encourage you, I can't, I would have played that video, but we're running out of time and I can't do that through this Zoom slide presentation, but I encourage you read Pat Lencioni books and check out that video. It's about three minutes long and I play it uh, in almost every session for my clients to get them to adapt that team one mindset before a session. Okay, some resources. The EOS franchise playbook. So everything I walked you through, there is a PDF I have that goes into way more detail. Uh, it was written for franchises as well as for the implementer community because I wanted to create something for implementers who, are, who to help them do a better job servicing franchise clients. So it's for you and for any franchise interested in EOS, also for implementers to make sure that we as a community are serving our clients in the best capacity we can and adding the most value. So if you're interested, please contact me and I'll shoot you the PDF. It's free. And uh, it goes into much more detail about all of this stuff. You can check out the website. There's, there's my what, microsite, tons of downloadable videos, blogs. You can download pretty much every tool we talked about here. Um, all the books, How to Be a Great Boss is an awesome one. There's about five or six in the library. A great way to continually train your, your people too. Again, I have a team of people, uh, an EOS implementer franchise cohort. And essentially we share best practices. We meet every quarter. I want to make sure that there's a team of people who I know in the EOS community who are committed and interested in working with franchises. So you can reach out to me. I'm always happy to help you. No strings attached, no sales pitch. Um, and I also have a team of franchisees of EOS implementers around the country who I know are doing great work with franchises. So if you ever want to work with someone locally and I can't help you, there's someone I can probably refer you to. And then 90.io, great resource. So I hope that EOS, I know that what EOS did for me and the teams I work with can do for you, help you really do, and your franchisees do what you love to do, people that you like to be around, share your values, making the kind of difference you want, making the kind of money you and they want, and having the time in your life to do other things. So um, I know we only have a couple minutes left. We're, we're, we're running. So sorry for the hyperspeed. There's the QR code for 90 if anybody wants access to the, to the free trial of it. Um, or just to poke around in the platform. What questions, if any, do we have? And I can hang on a little longer if anybody has questions and, and, and wants to hang out. So the floor is open. And thank you for those who are running. Thank you for your time. I know two hours is a lot. So um, thanks so much, guys. I hope this was valuable for you. And please, there's my information. You can follow me on LinkedIn. I post every day about EOS stuff or email me for any of this information or with questions you have or to chat. Thanks, right. guys. Um, Justin, we have costs for implements from Jake White. That's probably something you can talk to offline because there's a sliding scale there. Um, yep. Do you want them to contact you through the website or via email? Just email um, me. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'll do after this, guys, is I will send the recording, the follow-up. We'll resend any Justin uh, information as well. Um, and if you have any questions, you can talk to me or Justin. Thanks so much, Justin. I got to run to another FBR roundtable. Appreciate you guys, and we'll see you all soon. Thanks, everybody. Email me if you have questions, and I appreciate you. Be well, everyone. Talk to you soon.